Welcome back to Dirty Medicine. In this video, we will be talking about patient confidentiality. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. Before I get into today's video, if you like my channel and want to support my mission to provide free medical education, please consider becoming a Dirty Medicine member by clicking the join button. You can see the join button on my channel homepage underneath every video and as the first link in the description of any video. In exchange for providing secure financial support of my channel, which is directly deposited through YouTube and therefore or through Google in the amount of $4.99, you will become a Dirty Medicine member. This means you gain access to the locked section of my channel, so you'll be able to vote on polls regarding what you want the topic of the next video to be. In the future, there will definitely be other perks as well. And anytime you comment anywhere on my channel, you'll get the cool Dirty Medicine logo after your name. So if you like my channel, please consider signing up. Now let's get into today's video. We're going to be talking about patient confidentiality. Let's start with HIPAA. HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This is a federal law that was signed in 1996. And basically what HIPAA does is that it establishes national standards for the protection of patient health information. The huge emphasis within HIPAA is protected health information or PHI. What is PHI? Well, PHI refers to individual identifiable patient health information. So basically anything that might identify a patient. This includes the following items. It could be patient information. So their name, date of birth, email or phone number, their medical record number, their social security number, any biometric identification. So for example, their fingerprint, photographs of the patient, insurance information about the patient, hospital bills, or any dates of care that might have pinned the patient to being in the hospital or at the healthcare clinic. So the way to think about protected health information is any information, past, present, or future, that could identify a patient. And as you see from looking at this list, usually PHI is found on documentation, but it doesn't need to be limited to documentation. It's any information on any medium at any time that could potentially identify a patient and compromise their confidentiality. So that's protected health information. Now, healthcare organizations that utilize protected health information are considered covered entities. So any healthcare organization that utilizes PHI, which of course would be hospitals, clinics, emergency rooms, anything, because if you go back to the previous slide and you look at that list of information that qualifies for PHI, it's pretty much any healthcare organization or facility anywhere. So any healthcare organization that uses PHI is, consider, is considered a covered entity. So the question becomes, what's a covered entity? Covered entities are responsible for safeguarding PHI and upholding HIPAA standards. So what, do, what does this include? This includes healthcare providers, so the actual people that work within the organizations, healthcare plans, healthcare clearinghouses, and all business associates. Now, it's very high yield to get a question on USMLE or Comlex or your in-class exams that asks you about a seemingly neutral third party. So you're going to get a question where they talk about some hospital or some clinic that's doing business with some external third party. So for example, something that has to do with like billing. And those third parties have to sign what's known as a business associates agreement or a BAA. And business associate agreements basically tie the third party to the covered entity in terms of having to uphold these HIPAA standards when utilizing PHI. So it's very, un it's very high yield to understand how that relationship works. Now, occasionally, covered entities are able to disclose PHI without the authorization of the patient whose confidentiality will be disclosed. And the use of the covered entities using the PHI without the authorization of the patient, this is referred to as a permitted use disclosure. So what, what does this include? This could include public health interests. So when doctor's offices or hospitals need to submit to public health agencies reportable diseases, judicial proceedings, so the legal system can become involved and legally obtain PHI from hospitals, from covered entities without the authorization of the patient, 
um, related, we have law enforcement purposes, cadaver donations, payments or healthcare corp operations, data obtained for research, information that gets submitted uh, through anonymous reporting for victims of abuse, the prevention of threats. So if a patient tells a physician that they're going to go kill somebody, that would be threat prevention and that physician does not need to get the authorization of the patient to alert the proper parties. Essential government functions and workers' compensation. So basically, this is a list of things or times when covered entities can disclose confidential information without the authorization of the patient. And again, these are referred to as permitted use disclosures. Now, permitted use disclosures need to abide by what's known as the minimum necessary principle. And as that name implies, this is basically what is the least amount of information that can be disclosed to accomplish the goal of the information disclosure. So for example, if a hospital needs to submit information regarding the fact that one of its patients has a communicable and reportable disease, it will do so, but it will do so within this guiding principle of only releasing the minimum amount of information necessary to accomplish their goal in reporting that communicable, reportable disease. So it's basically the government cracking down on healthcare covered entities and saying, hey guys, hey girls, if you're going to release information without the authorization of the patient, only do what's necessary at minimum to accomplish the goal and then don't give any more information. So this really should be a little bit intuitive. So now that we've talked a lot about HIPAA, we've talked about covered entities, we've talked about permitted use disclosures, let's do some examples and talk about some ethical situations that might come up on USMLE or Comlex. So example one, a family is asking for information about a patient's health. Do you give the family the information or what? Well, the solution here is that as long as the patient is the legal decision maker and the patient has capacity, you do not reveal any information whatsoever without the permission or authorization of the patient, okay? So on an exam, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, but if you can discern from the question that the patient has capacity and is the legal decision maker, so it's not a child or anything like that, then you never give the family information. Never, never, never. Example two, a patient who lacks capacity is hospitalized. The family is requesting information regarding the status of the patient's health. What do you do? Do you give the family the information? Do you have to ask the patient first? What do you do? Well, the solution here is that in this example, it is permissible to reveal the status of the patient's health to the surrogate decision maker. And I'm putting the word surrogate decision maker in here because that is different than the patient's family. So just because a patient lacks capacity does not suddenly mean that you go and talk to the family about how the patient's doing. So for example, if the patient had a massive myocardial infarction, is hooked up to a ventilator, and does not have the capacity to engage in healthcare treatment decision making, that doesn't mean you go and tell the family all of that information. You still need to respect the patient's confidentiality because for all you know, that patient may not have wanted his or her health information shared publicly with family members. You don't know if the family are close family or if, or if they are estranged. You, you just simply don't know. So in this situation, you theoretically would have assessed the patient for capacity and clearly the patient is incapacitated at this time and therefore all information flows through the surrogate decision maker. All right, next example. Example three, a patient has a medical condition that puts others at risk when he is driving a vehicle. You talk to the patient about this and the patient goes, I'm fine, I can keep driving. I don't know where that accent came from, by the way, but that, that was how I imagined that patient responding. Um, what do you do? What do you as the physician do in this situation? Well, the solution here is that the physician should follow the appropriate state laws and make a report of the patient's impairment. So in doing so, this is, this is how this works. So first, or number one, you want to empathetically explain the concern to the patient and the family. So I want you to imagine you're taking USMLE or Comlex. You get a question of a patient who just has these terrible recurrent seizures, and therefore the patient really shouldn't be driving anymore. 
and it'll say which of the following is the first statement is the most appropriate initial statement and it'll give you like five quotes the first thing you always want to do is empathize so you want to explain and empathize with the patient or the patient's family then step two you try to help the patient understand the risks that they pose so step one is empathize and allow that safe space for the patient to talk freely step two now it's time to help them understand. You have to explain to them the risk that they pose to others if they were, for example, to have a seizure while driving a vehicle. And then step three, you need to start to be honest and disclose. So you need to tell them that there's a legal requirement for you as a physician to report this impairment and that the authorities, not you, but the authorities who you submit that report to ultimately make the final decision about whether or not the patient's license gets pulled. Okay, so in summary, three steps, empathize, help them understand, disclose, empathize, help them understand, disclose. That's what you do in this example. Example four, a patient is diagnosed with chlamydia. The patient expresses concern for their partner and asks the physician to write a prescription so that the partner who is not a patient of the physician's can also gain access to treatment. So in this example, your patient, you're the doctor and your patient is diagnosed with chlamydia and your patient's partner, the patient fears that they might also, their partner might also have chlamydia because they had intercourse. And they're asking you to write a prescription that they can give to their partner who's not your patient. So what do you do? Well, in this example, the physician might first encourage the patient to facilitate getting their partner medical treatment through a traditional doctor patient doctor patient relationship so this part's perhaps kind of obvious you would say to the patient or encourage them to have their pa have their partner go to a clinic go to an emergency room whatever it is but the second step of this solution is what you probably didn't know um, if this is not possible so if the patient's partner cannot go th go get a traditional doctor patient relationship then the physician may consider expedited partner therapy. What is expedited partner therapy? Dirty, what is this? Expedited partner therapy is the practice of treating patient partners who may have had a sexually transmitted exposure even though they're not the index patient. So even though they're not your patient. So the physician really can give treatment and give a prescription to a pa to an index patient's partner, and that's known as expedited partner therapy. Now, the physician should only practice EPT in accordance with all local and state laws and regulations, as well as under the guidance of public health authorities. And you probably have never heard of this before because a lot of physicians simply don't do this because they don't feel comfortable doing it. But as of the this video being created, um, EPT is permissible in 45 states and it's potentially allowable in four more. Uh, last I checked, it is prohibited in South Carolina. So anybody who's watching this video, A, I'm not a lawyer. B, I'm not an ethicist. So check all of your state and local laws and regulations, um, your public health authorities, and make sure you're practicing good medical legal ethical medicine but as far as for educational purposes only expedited partner therapy is gaining a lot of momentum and my guess is that this will be something that's quite popular in maybe five years from now so you need to know this that this is bound to show up on some exam this is very important information that they don't teach you and a lot of people just don't know so that's expedited partner therapy all right let's let's do another example Example five, a patient is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. The family tells the physician that the patient would not want to know this information and requests that the physician withholds the diagnosis from the patient. So the question here is what do you do? Do you tell the patient? Do you withhold the information permanently? What, what do you do? Well, solution. In this example, the physician might, one, attempt to understand why the family does not want the patient to know the information. So this is the classic USMLE or Comlex ethics question. They give you a situation, you feel like you're being thrust into the middle of this ethical dilemma, and they say, which of the following is the best initial course of action? And the answer is almost always going to be attempt to understand. It is your job to understand why one of the parties is creating this ethical dilemma. So that's always going to be the correct answer if you have to pick the initial action. But then number two, 
discuss with the patient what they do or do not want to know. So you attempted to understand why the family wants you to withhold. Then you go to the patient and you discuss with them plainly. You go, hey, I've got some information to tell you. It may make you upset. It may not. Do you want to know? And you get their answer. Do they want to know? And then step three, you communicate the relevant information based on the patient's preference. So if they want to know, you tell them. And if they don't want to know, you don't. So as a general rule of thumb with these types of questions on USMLE or Comlex, here's the sequence. Attempt to understand, discuss with the patient slash family, communicate relevant information. This is how you do this. This is the flow. This is always the answer. Okay. Now, what is, this what is this known as? This is known as therapeutic privilege. This refers to a physician withholding information from a patient if it is deemed that the disclosure of this information would be psychologically contraindicated. So in the previous example, the patient's family insists that the patient does not want to know that they are going to be diagnosed or have um, with pancreatic carcinoma. So if the physician goes to the patient and agrees that the patient is not in a current state of mind to receive that information, then the doctor will use what's known as therapeutic privilege. And this allows the physician to withhold information. Now, if the physician invokes therapeutic privilege, the information is not permanently delayed. Okay, So this doesn't mean you never tell the patient that they have pancreatic cancer. Instead, a plan should be instituted between the patient and the patient's family with the physician being the coordinator to ensure a timely yet appropriate delivery of all relevant information. So the bottom line here, very high yield, is that if you're using therapeutic privilege, it doesn't mean that you never tell them. It just means that you're not telling them right now. So how do you remember this? Therapeutic privilege, TP, the patients are told patiently. Therapeutic privilege, told patiently. You're going to be patient about telling them the information. It's not going to be right now, but it's also not going to be never. That's therapeutic privilege.